Welcome everyone and thank you for joining to today's Danvers Expert Talks. We have lined up for you a quite exciting uh, list of speakers today. My name is uh, Julia Panzer. I'm the Director for Strategic Communication here at Danvers Schooling and I will also be your moderator of today. Furthermore, we have on our uh, operator, Orisha Biekia, who's our learning expert in Danfoss. So without further ado, we jump into the webinar while you get settled in. And a couple of practicalities before we get started. Uh, you are in listen-only mode. So um, we also want to hear from you, of course. So please put your questions or comments into the comment box that you see on the right-hand side in the GoToWebinar. That's quite important. You can raise your hand throughout the presentation and uh, we will, of course, uh, record this webinar uh, to distribute further on for your use. So what is the topic of today, actually? Um, in line with uh, last week's World Food Day, we put together an exciting talk around food wastage. And the topic here is really looking at the role of the cold chain and how that impacts uh, the topic of food wastage. So we have a um, quite a good lineup, one from uh, the NGO perspective, but actually really looking at the progress that is done towards the Sustainable Development Goal 12.3, reducing food wastage per capita. Then we have a view of the industry actually in a country, which is India, where we have a lot of potential on the cold chain. And third, uh, we have an inf information and more deep dive on innovation in the cold chain and how we can really improve the traceability and visibility across the cold chain. For that, we have lined up for you these three speakers. Dr. Liz Goodwin, I will introduce her furthermore in a couple of minutes, which is really the thought leader, I would say, on food loss and waste. So we're quite happy that you can join us. Thank you, Liz, for that. And we have Krishna, um, our internal Danfoss colleague. He's located in India to give us this deep dive into a local country where we see a lot of potential for growing the cold chain. And then we have Ian Jones joining us uh, that and from Coolit, who's giving us a more innovative digitalization approach to the cold chain. So why are we talking actually about food wastes and the cold chain? Why is this important? And as you probably know already, there is quite a bit of food that is produced, actually one third, uh, that is either lost or wasted. That means either on the way while it's transported to your supermarket or in our homes. So that's a huge environmental, economic, and uh, safety problem for the world. So not only the UN has put that up, the Sustainable Development Goals, but also a lot of businesses have it actually already in their own uh, sustainability targets to reduce food loss and waste. But what exactly is food wastage? And here we want to just give you a quick introduction to the terminology because we see that across the board this is still used uh, differently. So when you see here, everything that basically happens from harvest uh, to the supermarket um, and around that is considered food loss by the World Food Authority. And then on the other hand, once it goes into the supermarket, once we buy it as consumers, then that's called food waste. And that's also the overall terminology. So when we speak about this later on, and Liz will refer to that, then you have that in mind. That overall, it's called food wastage, but we dis like distinguish in food loss and food waste. So Liz, without any further ado, we have you on as a panelist. And uh, for those of you that don't know Liz, she's uh, the senior fellow and director at the World Resources Institute for Food Loss and Waste. She's chairing also the London Waste and Recycling Board. And before that, uh, she's been heading the uh, Waste and Resource Action Program. So a lot of credibility, and I think very interestingly is that you have a PhD in chemistry, and, and that's also super important when we talk about the topics because it's quite complex. So the floor is yours, and you will give us a, a progress report on the SDG 12.3. Great. Thank you very much, and um, hello, everyone. Um, I won't say good morning because I don't know whether it's everyone's in the same time zone. Uh, there we go. So. I wanted to, to update you about um, the work that we're doing um, on 
on food loss and waste, um, I'm one of the champions for achieving that, um, that sustainable development goal. I'm struggling to change my slides. Thank you, Julia. So as, as Julia has already said, the, um, about a third of, foo of food um, by weight is actually lost somewhere between production and um, the household. And in terms of energy content, in terms of calories and beneficial um, to the population, it's about 25%, 24%. Next slide. And food is lost and wasted along the entire chain. So um, it's lost at the farm level, it's lost during storage, it's lost during the processing and packaging, it's lost um, in distribution to markets, and ultimately it's lost in, in the household as well. So it's, it's an issue all along the supply chain. But the amounts that are lost in different parts changes depending on where you are. So um, food loss is more of a problem near the, near the fork uh, it, it's, it's more of a, a problem um, in the household for developed countries, whereas in developing countries, it's far more about an issue um, in the supply chain. So the food is lost at the farm or, or on the way through the supply chain. So la a couple of years ago, when the sustainable development goals were set, one of them is specifically around um, tackling the issue of food waste. And the target 12.3 is about halving food waste at the retail and consumer levels and reducing food losses along the supply chain. And Champions 12.3 was set up at the same time, and it's a coalition of, of leaders from, drawn from across the world um, who, have take, who, who are all very committed to tackling food waste and food loss. And so we have dedicated ourselves to ensuring that that sustainable development goal is achieved um, by 2030. And um, so we're a group of about uh, 41 um, leaders at the moment from across the world and from across the supply chain, including um, business leaders, uh, government leaders, um, NGOs, uh, and, and research organizations. So it's a, it's a very wide, eclectic mix of, of people. And what we did in September was we uh, published uh, a progress report, which was the second progress report we'd done. Um, and we will continue to do them every year uh, up until 2030 to describe how well the world is doing and to review how well the world is doing in terms of um, move, making progress towards 12.3. And I have to say that the um, Champions 12.3 is probably the only non-UN group that we're aware of that is monitoring one of the SDGs. Um, but I think it will help to ensure that there is sufficient focus on the issue. And the overall um, strategy that we've got for, um, for tackling food waste is Target Measure Act. So we need lots of countries and companies setting targets um, that are consistent with uh, Sustainable Development Goal 12.3. We then need them to be measuring. And when you measure, you know you can understand where you're losing the food waste. And then we need to take action to address those things. So that's our overall approach. So we we do our review in following that that overall strategy. So targets they set ambition, and ambition motivates action. And one of the big progresses that we made in the last year is that the Global Agribusiness Alliance um, set a, a resolution. They agreed a resolution to halve food loss in the supply chain. Now that's an organisation of supply chain companies um, throughout, uh, spreading across the supply chain. And it's fantastic to see this, this grouping of organizations setting a target, um, which now complements what the Consumer Goods Forum did in 2015. Um, and then, as I say, what gets measured get ma gets managed. If you're measuring something, you're able to manage it. And there's been a lot of progress um, during the course of the year on measurement, in particular in, among companies. So um, companies like Tesco, Sainsbury's, Danone, um, Kellogg and Nestle are now measuring and re publicly reporting on their, on their figures, um, demonstrating best practice for the sector. And on action, well, what ultimately matters is action. Um, and it is everybody's responsibility 
we've seen an awful lot of um, burgeoning of activity um, across the across the world in terms of of action, um, and they've and lots of new initiatives. And one of the newest ones is the Consumer Goods Forum uh, have committed to rolling out uh, standardisation of date labels across the world. So making sure, trying to address this issue of confusion over date labels. So, so there are there are lots of signs of progress um, happening, but ultimately, is it enough? Well, one of the things we've done this year is we've tried to lay out a roadmap to achieving um, 12.3. So, what sort of progress do we need um, in the next three years if we're going to achieve it? And we've split it up by three year um, sections up to 2030. Um, if we're actually going to achieve a 50% reduction by 2030. And I should say you can find a copy of this of this roadmap and the report on the um, Champions 12.3 website. And what we've then done is uh, looked at the roadmap and the milestones in the roadmap and said, okay, so if there's is is there enough progress? So green is yes, there's enough progress. Yellow is there's some progress, but um, it's below what we need to do. And red, it's really not not great, and we and progress is backsliding, and we need to do more. So going through the various the, the three areas of the strategy, if we look at target setting, our assessment of target setting is that companies are actually doing quite well now. I mentioned about the Consumer Goods Forum and the um, Global Agribusiness Alliance setting targets. Nearly 60% of the world's largest companies have actually set targets and um, have programs. So that is really encouraging. Um, by contrast, governments are still not doing enough. And we estimate that countries with targets only cover about 28% of the population. So we think we need to do more because if you know target setting is the first step, and if we've only got 20% covered by targets so far, that's not good enough. On measuring and reporting, um, we're we are slightly um, more pessimistic. Um, companies, there are signs. I mentioned a few names of. Um, companies who are measuring and publicly reporting on their food waste, but we need far more. There are thousands and thousands of companies out there. We need far more reporting. And governments, we um, are very disappointed that only 7% of the world's population are, live in countries where there has there is measurement happening, um, which is really, really not good enough. And then on action, um, it's a slightly more positive picture. Companies, certainly more than 10% of the largest um, food companies now have active programs, and so that's quite encouraging. Um, on governments, there has been a burgeoning of initiatives, but they don't really cover enough of the population um, to, to be, be any realistic way of likely to achieve the first milestone of 2018, which is 20% of the population being covered. So I think my overall take is there are some good areas, some areas where things are good and there's some areas where there are clearly problems. Um, and by doing this analysis, it's going to mean that the champions um, in the course of the next year know where to focus. So we need to focus on getting countries measuring. We need to focus on getting um, governments actually setting targets. Um, so so that this analysis really just helps us to um, understand where where the, where the biggest issues are, and then we can take action. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for this introduction and overview also of the, the state of food wastage, I would call it. And, uh, and you're right, I mean, on all the SDGs, I think this is really one of the most comprehensive overviews that we've seen so far. So thank you for that work. Um, of yours. With that, um, I think there must be some questions from the audience. And as I said, the uh, comment box serves for our discussion since you are muted. And I see that we have one question already here in the comment box uh, for you, Liz. It says regarding the target setting, how can more governments be motivated to set reduction targets regarding food loss? Well, it's a ver it's a very good question. I think. Um, we're, we're trying to find ways of, of engaging with governments. I think if if um, more people can demand that their governments um, set targets, that, that would be very helpful. I mean, we are targeting uh, the environment departments or the agriculture departments, 
and trying to engage them to understand how seriously they are taking the issue um, and whether they're, whether or not they're um, doing anything active. Because all countries have, have, in theory, signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals, but there are an awful lot of, there are 169 goals, so actually uh, it's very possible for some of the targets to get lost in the in the noise and um, so it's important to make sure that this is this issue is is high up the agenda and, and do you see that there's like a difference in between food waste and food loss and how governments approach these two topics um, is there are, are these two are the differences clear enough and is there the right focus on both loss and waste um, I think it's patchy I think in some places you know, certainly in in the developing developed countries, so Europe um, and uh, um, the UK and the USA, but also increasingly in cities in developing countries, um, you're seeing you're seeing quite a lot of focus on household food waste, um, and I think people can see a um, a benefit to the householder from reducing the food waste, a uh, financial one if nothing else. I think there's the issues in developing countries are far more fragmented um, and that's more difficult to to know what the right solutions are and how you make the right right interventions mm. yeah definitely there's a, a second question list here and this is let me quickly read it out here how will it be possible to get more transparency uh, from governments and to compare actually the food wastage uh, happening. So I uh, kind of, I imagine this question is targeted to uh, is there a baseline? Can we actually compare country by country or city by city um, on food waste and loss? Um, I think there are there are signs of some of that happening. Um, the, Euro the European Union is working on a um, a reporting platform which will allow all the member countries of the EU European Union to have visibility of what what the wastage is like in their in their member countries so there'll be some benchmarking um, I think the publication of um, results by some of the uh, retailers including their supply chains is also going to provide some sort of benchmarking um, but it but I think at the moment there's so little data out there that it's very difficult to do sensible benchmarking yeah, that's also what I think what we are seeing here is very interesting. Thank you for that. I think we have one other question before we probably move on to the next speaker. And this one is from Jean Franck. I cannot see it in my setup. So, Orisha, can you maybe support and tell us what the third question here is? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, what is the best action taken last year that you could use as an example to illustrate food waste reduction? Right. So, question um, from <laughs> the best action taken last year. Um, well, I, th I I personally think it's the initiative by the by the retailers to uh, address the. Um, the issue of date labels because we estimate that something like up to 20% of food waste is caused by householders getting confused by the date label and throwing it away before it's actually unsafe to eat um, and also mixing up the difference between a best before date and a sell by date and, and throwing away something that's just passed its best before date and is still perfectly safe to eat so addressing that um, it's, it's still in its early days, it's only an announcement about implementing it, but that could make a big difference if we can get rid of this confusion. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. So we will now move on to, uh, to Krishna to give us the, the local experience um, in India. Uh, but Liz will be on with us uh, throughout the webinar, so you can also at a later stage the last question at the, the end. So Krishna here, um, he will discuss with us, uh, yeah, the challenges really uh, in a country where there's still a lot to do on uh, on the cold chain, but also where there's a lot of potential actually, because there's a lot of food grown in India. Krishna works um, in our Chennai office in uh, Danfoss, and he 
has been with us since 2013. So, Chiska, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julia. And uh, thank you, Liz, for setting up uh, the discussion uh, here. And I think uh, Liz has set, uh, set it up uh, very well for me uh, to take it forward from where she has left in terms of uh, why it is important to have an SDG sustainable development goal, especially on food and uh, food loss and food waste. And uh, just to put it in context of uh, 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 at a very uh, ground level and not at a very high level of sustainable development goals, uh, just to look at this picture that is there on the screen now, what we see there is a kiwi there. And uh, when, when this kiwi, I go to buy it in the Indian market, while there is a lot of kiwi produced within the country, I get a kiwi which is imported all the way from New Zealand. And that is the context with which uh, I think we need to look at cold chain and uh, why the infrastructure for cold chain is required in a country like India. And what I mean by saying that I, I get it sourced all the way from New Zealand, it is not bad to get it sourced all the way from New Zealand. It is just that I need to pay the additional cost of importing it all the way from New Zealand while something is available to me in my own market, which is not being able to reach my table because it doesn't have an infrastructure and it is getting lost. And the farmer, despite toiling to produce that, he is not able to reap the benefits of the produce that he has done. So here we are basically talking about the income loss to the farmer while the sustainable development goal is important, it is important that the farmer gets the, the money for what he has produced. And with this, with this context is what I would like to uh, cover uh, the presentation. And uh, I would basically cover it in uh, four key topics in terms of the first step would be on which way the Indian economy is moving. and. Uh, what are the macro trends within this economy that are leading to the way the agriculture setup is being set up in the country? And uh, because of this, what are the key challenges that are coming in with respect to cold chain? And uh, lastly, I would try to touch upon some of the things that we are doing along with a lot of stakeholders within the country on improving the cold chain infrastructure. So when we look at uh, the Indian economy, and uh, the data that you see on the slide is uh, largely with respect to the last uh, three to four years. Uh, with the new government in place, uh, there are a lot of initiatives that the government has started, uh, which has kick-started a lot of uh, manufacturing within the country. It has also improved uh, the investment climate for the country and you do see a lot of uh, foreign direct uh, investments uh, coming in. So clearly there is a lot of push for reforms and we clearly see that there is an uptake in terms of the capex that is coming into the country and uh, there is improvement in terms of the numbers, uh, whether it is GDP or uh, GVP that we talk about. And what does uh, this mean uh, to the agriculture setup within the country? And when we have to look at this, it uh, within the agriculture setup, we, we can look at it a little beyond the last three years. And when, when we look at it probably over the last two decades, when the liberalization has uh, set up in the country, you have seen that there is a lot of urbanization that has taken place within the country and more and more people have moved into urban cities. And the disposable income of the population has also increased because of various things that have happened which are, which are which are good for the country in terms of liberalization there are more jobs that have come in and uh, there is there is obviously a higher uh, strata that the people have moved in and their food habits have changed and what we have seen over the last few years is that the food habits have changed because uh, of the disposable income and that people want to move towards a protein rich diet 
which means that they are looking for more milk based for, uh, food, more uh, egg based uh, items, more processed based uh, foods, meat based items and this, this has increased and, uh, and we, we do see that this trend is going to increase as we increase the urbanization levels in the country and as the country moves up the path of uh, development. So what has what does this entail? So this what this has entailed is that we have seen a growth in terms of the retail sector that there is more organized retail that is coming into the country. We have seen a growth in the processed food category. We have seen that farmers are increasingly moving towards horticulture crops because that is where they are seeing that there is more demand. We have clearly seen that there are more and more government initiatives that are coming in towards enabling these kind of infrastructure setups. So, so if all this is being set up, does this mean that we are able to meet the supply or we know what exactly the demand is? The most recent uh, study indicates that uh, in terms of uh, Indian rupee numbers, close to 92,000 crore worth of food loss happens. This, this also includes some amount of waste and that is a substantial amount that we are talking about. And if, if we are going to continue this trend, because what we do see as, uh, it's not moving to the next slide. What we do see is that, that, that this, uh, increase in urbanization is going to continue and uh, uh, we, we do see that some of the cities within the country will grow to the sizes of some of the countries within uh, Southeast Asia. The, the most recent McKinsey report indicates that uh, a city like Bombay by 2030 would, would be having a GDP which would be equal to that of Malaysia and uh, the population would also be you know, of that size. So, so we are talking of increasing numbers of uh, population in the cities. So there is an increasing gap between the farm to the, the, where it is produced to where it is consumed. And we do not have the necessary infrastructure in place. And even if today we are having this kind of loss, the question that comes into play is how do you ensure that this loss is minimized so that you can cater to the demand that is there of the population and also ensure that the farmer who is producing this gets his income because that is also one of the main requirements towards meeting the uh, SDGs. So when we when we look at what what is it that the government is doing towards ensuring that this is put in place is, is the government taking necessary steps and here we do see that the government is has been quite proactive in terms of uh, enabling a lot of policies towards getting this infrastructure in place. Uh, we, 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 we have seen that the uh, ministry has sanctioned 42 mega food parks across the country because India is a, is a vast country. And these 42 mega food parks, the, the design is conceptualized in a manner where uh, you can have both backward and forward integration so that you, you, you have a better connect between the farmer and the consumer. And these, these projects are at various stages of implementation. At the same time, over the last uh, three years, there are a lot of cold chain projects uh, worth about 7.5 million metric tons that have been established by uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. The uh, 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 government has also enabled uh, investments uh, and uh, brought in 100% uh, FDI to enable uh, the retailers to set up infrastructure. They have also amended policies so that retailers can directly purchase from farmers. And within the Make in India initiative of this government, they have made food processing a priority sector. And the priority sector is a term that uh, is used uh, especially from a financing angle because with, with that uh, terminology, banks will lend uh, uh, at a uh, concessional rate for setting up these uh, food processing uh, facilities. 
So there is a lot of work that uh, the government is doing in terms of enabling policies and, and we do see significant investments coming in. But uh, having been uh, working uh, within this environment, while we do see that there is a lo lot of proactive measures that are uh, being undertaken by uh, the um, government and a lot of stakeholders, there are quite a few challenges that we see within the environment that uh, uh, is there within the country. And these challenges are not unique to India. They are they are, they are mostly they will be the same in terms of uh, uh, the infrastructure that is available uh, in India. And these these challenges are different when you look at it from different sectors because cold chain would be required uh, for uh, uh, dairy, cold chain would be required for fisheries, cold chain would be required for fruits and vegetables. And when you look at it from this angle, the challenges that a farmer who is dealing with dairy uh, would be different to the challenges that uh, what a farmer in fruits and vegetables would be dealing. But the challenges would be common in terms of that both of them would be looking for people who have the skill sets to help them in getting these uh, things uh, done. But when we look at skill sets, the skill sets that would be required for let's say sorting, grading, packing the fruits and vegetables against something that is required to do at a farm level for, for a shrimp farming to something that is required to ensure that somebody takes the milk and puts it in a bulk milk cooler and uh, takes it across to ensure that it is done in the right way are different. And this is an area where we see that there is a lot of shortage of this kind of skilled manpower. And at the same time, we also see that educational institutions are generally covering an area on broadly on refrigeration, but there is no specific uh, uh, subjects that are being taught even in agriculture universities on how cold chain is important for farmers because most of these agricultural graduates are the ones who are supporting farmers as we move forward. Now the other challenge, the second challenge that we do see is the standards and protocols that are required. Because the when the cold chain infrastructure is being set up, there, there is no set uh, standards that have been established in terms of what is the temperature that is required, what is the humidity levels that are required for a particular fruit or a particular vegetable to move from the farm to the retail store. And these are different because you, you, you just can't bring them from a developed country and adapt them to the, and copy them uh, here in this country because the temperatures that are available in Europe are very different to the temperature zones that are available in India. So you need to develop them here and that is something that needs to be worked along with universities and uh, research establishments. And there is a lot of standardization that is required in terms of setting up the infrastructure because most of these infrastructure that is set up at uh, these rural places does not have any set standards that they follow. They take the most local uh, contract available and set up the infrastructure. So there is not exact standardization that is followed, which lead to some accidents, even sometimes causing uh, 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 accidents and uh, uh, that leads to the uh, policies where, wherein there have been some state governments which have said not to use ammonia. Whereas uh, uh, if the right standardizations are available, it could enable them to have the right kind of refrigerants and the right kind of technology to be used leading to the right SDGs in place. And the last challenge that comes in is innovation. Because there are a lot of technologies that are available because in cold chain infrastructure as such has been already established in countries like Europe and, and a lot of other uh, developed uh, nations. But we need to see how to adapt these technologies into a country uh, like uh, India and this is where uh, reverse innovation uh, comes into play. And uh, when we look at uh, this uh, uh, challenges 
and we we what we have done is tried to engage uh, on these challenges within the government and the stakeholders and what you see in this slide is there are basically one is the government bodies and within the government bodies there are multiple stakeholders involved the state the state government the central government within the central government the food processing ministry the agriculture ministry the fisheries ministry the dairy ministry then you have the farmer producer organizations then there is the research institutions you have the industry bodies and you have the technology producers so so uh, if you want to work in this particular aspect of how to improve this infrastructure there are multiple stakeholders involved and the most important stakeholder is the farmer who is lying in a farm not exactly knowing how to do this and uh, i think that is where we need to try and understand uh, how do we engage with these people because it is important to engage with the farmer and make him understand and uh, on this i uh, uh, what i would like to say uh, is that we have tried to work on this uh, challenges in some of these aspects and try to address this uh, in a limited framework uh, what we have done is uh, with uh, industry bodies like uh, cii and along with a few other stakeholders within the industry we have worked uh, specifically with uh, farmers in tamil nadu on uh, banana and uh, we have had uh, quite a good success uh, rate here where we have uh, been able to get these uh, farmers together and uh, have been able to in triple their income at the farm level over a period of uh, six to seven years and uh, probably i will uh, exactly cover that in the next uh, slide on uh, so what is it that we have done with the with the banana farmers is a banana as uh, india as a country i mean is either in the first or second place in terms of the production of a lot of fruits and vegetables and uh, within banana we are we rank the first in terms of uh, the world's uh, banana production and we took up uh, this example uh, uh, within tamil nadu because tamil nadu ranks the highest in terms of banana production within the country and uh, if tamil nadu in itself was a country it it would have the production of banana would have been equal to almost the share of indonesia or ecuador so along with cii we took up this uh, study to understand how we can improve the uh, uh, income of the fa um, banana farmers and also reduce the food loss because when we started this close to 30% of the bananas that were being produced were being lost so here we worked along with the farmers and uh, since uh, farm holdings in india are very less we consolidated the farmers and brought together about 2000 acres and uh, by uh, scale of this 2000 acres we were able to establish a good cold chain infrastructure and uh, that enabled them to connect to the markets better and uh, over a period of 6 years they were able to increase their uh, farm level sale price of banana from 5 uh, rupees uh, per uh, kilogram of banana to about 15 rupees per kilogram so that has been uh, one of the success stories and uh, what we are trying to do with this success is to try and uh, work on the same uh, with uh, different uh, crops in uh, different states which is uh, what this uh, slide indicates and uh, i think broadly that is uh, i have uh, covered some of the challenges that are there and how we have tried to address uh, those challenges and uh, if there are any further questions probably i will take them thank you thank you thank you krishna for this really in depth uh, of course on the, the indian market and the challenges but also the solutions that are already possible there and can i just ask you because i remember i think india is the second largest food producer in the world but still imports food right yeah that is right and i think that's where i started with saying that we import the kiwi despite producing it in india yeah very interesting so we have already some questions here in the chat box and i'm trying to read this and it says here how do they respond to innovative cold chain technology i guess like i oh am yeah. 
uh, what are the experiences uh, of working with rural farmers in India so far? Um, and how do they respond to innovative culture and technology? Are they open for new business models? So what is the response there, Krishna? Yeah, see, uh, it depends on uh, which uh, part of the country we are talking about and uh, which sector we are talking about. Because in some parts of the country, uh, let's say Gujarat and Dairi, the, the technology that is adopted is quite advanced. And uh, within the same sector, when you go to some other part of the country, uh, you, you don't even, uh, the milk that is uh, used there is, uh, it, it doesn't go through any cold chain. So, so it depends uh, what we are talking about and uh, what level the farm farmers are there at that particular place. So it depends on really like the industry, so what kind of crops it is, and then also which area in the country. Yeah, and, and it would need a lot of uh, work with the farmers that we have to do to ensure that we build their confidence level to understand why it is required to be done the way we are saying, because they are used to a particular way of doing things. Very good. Thank you, Krishna, for this answer. We have another question here uh, from Torben, and uh, he's asking, did some think about a cold chain driver's license for farmers? No, uh, I, we haven't thought about a cold chain driver's license for farmers, and uh, uh, one of the aspects that uh, is important here is that the farm holdings here are very less. So the, the farmers are holding about one to two hectares of land. So the person who is actually uh, establishing the cold storage or the one who is running the reefer trucks is very different to the one who is actually producing it. So it's a different model that will apply here as against what is applied in developed countries. All right. Well, thank you, Krishna. I think that leads us really well over to the next part of the uh, webinar, where we talk a little bit more about the, the supply chain as such, or the cold chain. So not so much about how can we actually help farmers to get more of the produce to the markets, uh, which we have focused on here, but more, okay, what can we do throughout the cold chain to actually get more traceability? And, and that ties maybe also to the comment here from Torm on the, the driver's license um, question. Thank you, Krishna, again. And of course, Krishna will also stay on until the end of the, the presentations. So if there are any other questions coming up, you're most welcome to ask them. So now we move on to uh, Ian Jones, and he's um, introducing us to the innovation part of the cold chain, I would call it. He um, is actually sales director for, for Coolit, a solution that he will introduce uh, shortly that tracks across the, um, the cold chain. And that's maybe a little bit of you into into the future, really. So what can be done? So with that, Ian, the floor is yours. I will give you the presenter rights, and you can kick us off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, well, good day to you all. Um, really, just over the uh, the next ten minutes, uh, I'd like to talk to you about how we can establish really a sustainable cold chain and the opportunity available to us. Uh, to gain a greater transparency and trans, uh, traceability around temperature and the value that this can create in improving shelf life and redu reducing food wastage. Uh, as you'll see from the previous slides, that roughly 12% uh, of food waste can occur through the distribution and retail channel. And there are multiple causes that can impact this figure, such as in inaccurate forecasting, improper storage facilities, or general management of perishable goods. But one of the main contributions really comes from improper temperature control. Now, it's been mentioned through the webinar that one third of all food is wasted, and the impact that this has on our environment is significant. Food wastage creates 8% of the greenhouse gas emissions. It consumes one quarter of all water used by agriculture, and it has a significant economic impact of roughly $940 billion. Now, technology can play its part by developing solutions that can monitor, manage, and take action if and when temperature creates a risk to food safety and in turn waste. But for technology to address these issues, we also need to um, tackle the challenges that the uh, cold chain faces today. 
Now, some of these key challenges are, of course, food waste. Uh, we've spoken on food waste, the visibility into where, when, and why food waste occurs requires a greater holistic approach. Data records are required for legislation and some, and some cases law. Uh, and for example, France has led the way by introducing a ban on the retail market above 400 meters squared, sending food to land waste. And if that's breached, breach, then fines are, are applied. And then Italy last year introduced tax incentives for food waste donations. There's also the complexity, and complexity overshadows the cold chain due to the large number of stakeholders involved in the manufacture, distribution, and sale of perishable products. And a product can change hands multiple times before it reaches its retail shelf. And at each stage, there's a risk to maintaining temperature. With, with traceability, when when risks arise to food safety and a product needs to be recalled, then speed of action in tracing that product is a necessity. Uh, and also consumers are becoming more conscious and driving the need uh, to become more aware of the provenance and the sustainability of the grower and the supplier of the food they buy, we buy. And then there's a the shelf life. Shelf life has a significant impact on food waste, but also benefits the consumer in increasing food quality. Uh, but in turn, it influences our decision when choosing a brand or a store or a product. And the other most important point is the ecosystem. Uh, and that's last but not least, because having a temperature ecosystem is uh, is a difficulty and legacy equipment means that multiple hardware manufacturers and software platforms are in use which adds to the complexity of the whole whole cold chain and there's a need to engineer an environment which enables collaboration creates transparency and traceability you'll see here there are many different stakeholders involved everywhere from ag agriculture through to the point of sale and it's not unusual really to see each party working and collecting information within a silo and that creates the the challenges in gaining transparency and traceability but but really what if digitalization could allow us to really predict where food loss will occur or where food safety was breached where it could reduce energy by optimizing temperature before a product reaches the retail store, saving costs, or determine the energy consumption of the complete cold chain and set emission targets creating sustainability. And last but not least, utilize data from each of these individual stakeholders within the cold chain to capture and enable intuitive reporting, reducing energy consumption and, and increasing shelf life while in turn reducing food wastage. Now in enabling transparency the role of digital IoT solutions to monitor temperature are available today in different forms. Uh, you have from the very simplistic color change labels, you have LED indicators, RFID tags which are used on pallets and boxes, uh, to real-time data loggers and there are innovations coming through the pipeline now like biodegradable food sensors that will be available in the future. But it's evident that one size doesn't fit all and it's very difficult to achieve that not only now but also in the future with the growth of IoT. And it's estimated that in 2017 there could be as many as 28 billion IoT sensors used within industry and by 2019 this could increase to 40 billion. But out of that 40 billion, 20 billion are expected to be used within the food and drinks market. So that's creating choice, but also adding complexity. And this makes this a challenge when we're trying to align rules and governance, gain one end-to-end -end temperature overview, overview, but also then matching that to the product and the shipping data through the entire cold chain. Now, to address this, there are new solutions that are emerging uh, that can collect data across the entire cold chain and provide an opportunity really to create an awareness of risk, comparing what is the perceived risk against the actual risk, manage shelf life and food quality by moving from a first in, first out approach to more of a first expired, first out. 
and controlling waste by identifying and preventing where and when and why food waste occurs. And by, con by controlling food waste, then we can lower the economical costs and importantly environmental costs and in turn support a more sustainable cold chain. Now the benefits of implementing a holistic record of the real-time temperature journey are one record of events allows you to monitor where the produce is at at any point in time uh, to resolve instance when they actually do occur if you're retrieving information in real time. The ability to centralize and store data uh, such as manual audits which are frequently monitored throughout the product's journey and ensure the journey of the product starts at the right pre-cool temperature uh, and then enabling you to identify gaps in measurement or abuse as it takes place. Now the ability to capture product data along the temperature data as well as temperature data can bring tremendous value in relation to traceability within the cold chain. Creating traceability in relation to a pro product's provenance, uh, using data gathered to gauge the impact on produce shelf life to manage produce which expires first, moving to first expired, first out. And product data can allow you to quickly identify its origin, but also to know, uh, allow you to identify its location for recall. And provided data provides evidence that uh, can be used for hazard reporting, uh, and also to calculate how much food has been lost due to improper storage, um, and as we mentioned earlier, benchmarking. Now by taking these steps at every point in the journey allows us to register and provide a stamp on when these products arrive, when they leave and on which day. And this can be used to create clear notifications of when conditions outside of preferred limits are breached or even when temperature is not measured. That's just as important. So we've seen that cost on food wastage has a significant impact, 940 billion US dollars. But by focusing on the coal chain as a holistic ecosystem, there are significant gains to be made. There's been recent studies by Oliver Wyman that's shown that actually food wastage can be as high as 1 to 2 percent of a retailer's sales revenue. And by improving shelf life of a product by just one day can actually reduce food waste by as much as 40 percent. And we spoke on consumers. Uh, they've also, in their, in their market studies, found that 70% of consumers spend one third more on their produce when they shop if they're happy with the quality of the goods from the store. And companies that have a concern on investment costs, then the latest research by Champions 12.3 has, has identified that for every pound invested in reducing food waste, there's a 14 pound return. So the question we come back to is, can we manage what we don't measure? Now, with the availability of IoT sensor solutions and the convergence of software platforms that enable a temperature ecosystem to be formed, we can reduce the complexity and at the same time create transparency and traceability, really to identify the risks to food quality, monitor and reduce food waste, and save money and have a positive impact on the environment. This also creates an opportunity, but it will still require collaboration, really between the stakeholder groups within the cold chain, to really make this happen. I've listed here, if you have uh, further questions following uh, the webinar today, if you'd like to know more about the solutions which we offer, then please feel free to visit our website at www.coolit, uh, or there is uh, contact details there, the mobile phone number of myself, and also our email address where we can uh, connect you and give you further information. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ian, for this very inspiring insight into maybe not so much the future, but already today. But I think that kind of leads me to my first question, actually, on uh, so what's the biggest obstacle? Why is not everyone already doing this? Is there any, and is there any policy maybe in any country of the world that you know of where, uh, where that has helped to implement uh, this uh, connectivity solution? 
Uh, just the first part of that question, Julia, why is everyone not doing this? I think they uh, overall, uh, possibly there is a lack of governance throughout the supply chain for who actually takes the lead in uh, commanding that practices and processes change throughout the coal, coal chain. And I think that, that's largely driven by the complexity of uh, the different stakeholders involved from when the product is produced until it's reached at the, the retail store. So there's not a governance practice or process in place that we see today. All right, and uh, it does like the HACCP um, legislation, does that help with introducing better monitoring as a, from seen from an industry perspective? From an industry perspective, yes. It's, it's required through the, uh, through the monitoring to ensure that you you monitor and you record all of the cr critical control processes throughout food production. Uh, but that information is not necessarily shared at this moment in time between each party within the stakeholder group. Um, so that's why with an ecosystem platform, sharing and making that data visible helps the overall HAZAP supply process. Uh, and it's also a requirement that you have to have has that, uh, a pro has that process in place when you're dealing with uh, food, food stuffs, uh, perishable food, anything that is, uh, of course, influenced by temperature. All right, very interesting to hear. Thank you, Ian. So the floor now is open again to everyone. Um, submit your questions, and of course uh, to Ian, but also to the other uh, panelists. And uh, I also uh, encourage you, in between the panelists, if you have a question to one or the other, feel free to um, unmute yourself and just ask that question. And in the meantime, while you all think about your questions, I have one here from Kathleen Wagner, and she actually asked that, if I am not mistaken, to, to Krishna, uh, and it reads as follows, is it only a problem of the cold chain that many people do not have enough food to eat? How can we impact a better balance? Well, that's 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 a tough question. <laughs> it's it, see, it's just not the cold chain that uh, that is impacting the entire uh, food spectrum and uh, why food is not available to everyone. But uh, what cold chain would do is that uh, it would uh, ensure that uh, the farmer gets a higher income because he is currently losing between 10, 20 or 30 percent of his uh, food that he is producing. And uh, the parallel effect of that is that so much less is available in the market. Uh, so there is, while there is demand for the produce, because uh, there is lesser produce available, the consumer is paying a higher price. So in effect, with the cold chain infrastructure, you can increase the income of the farmer and reduce the price at the consumer level. Thank you. So indirectly, yes, there is a, um, like a positive societal as a benefit and from the cold chain as such. Thank you, yeah. Krishna. Already we have the second question here for um, Ian. And there's, uh, it's from Mark Menser, our colleague in the US. He's asking, please give us a sense of where we are likely to see first successes of Coolit. Well, we're, we're currently uh, piloting Coolit in Europe at this moment in time. Um, we're working uh, very closely with the supply, full cold chain from the producer, transportation, and retailer. Um, and I think there are certainly opportunities now within the United States with the Food Safety Modernization Act uh, and the emphasis around ensuring um, transparency in temperature throughout the transportation of uh, human and animal food. So I think uh, both of those regions are where we're probably likely to see uh, the implementation of, of Cool It First. Thank you, Ian. Are there any other questions? If not, I don't see any more, at least in our comment box. Hmm. 
No. If not, then I would invite you. First of all, thank you for joining the expert talk and thank you to uh, all three panelists for these excellent insights. On this slide, you see that uh, you can download, of course, on the Champions123 uh, uh, website, you can download the 2016 report list, I think, which is also really good and gives a good introduction on the magnitude of uh, food wastage. And then there's also the progress report for this year. And then if you can see on this slide, um, yeah, get engaged and stay in contact via Twitter um, or internally on Chatter. Twitter, I think we have uh, Liz Goodwin, WI Food, uh, we have um, Krishna also on Twitter, so feel free to get in contact with us, have a conversation, and uh, I look forward to maybe next year's report, uh, Liz. Hope there's some progress then. Thank Great, you. Thank <laughs>